Today, the Pfizer vaccine has received final approval from the Food and Drug Administration. So what does that mean for the fight against COVID-19? Well, at a minimum, it means you can expect a more intense push for mandates from bureaucrats, government officials, Democrats. The Vax police are coming for you, my friends. It's time for Hold the Line. Welcome to Hold the Line, I'm Buck Sexton. What a difference about six months or so makes, right? Remember at the beginning of this year, they were telling you, oh, the vaccine's amazing. It's going to end this pandemic. You just have to get it. Get the vaccine. You're over 90% protected. You're not even going to get COVID, they told you. You're certainly not going to be hospitalized or die from COVID. You're good. Just trust us. Yeah, it's an emergency authorization for it, but who cares? You can listen to the smart people behind this. That was the pitch. I think we all know that. I don't think anybody could really deny it. And then it changed. Then we were told, oh, actually, the vaccines fade pretty quickly. After eight months, in fact, you probably need a new shot. You need boosters. How many boosters are you going to need? Well, they don't even know, but probably boosters forever. But we'll come back to this in a second. First, how do they get the mandate forward? Because originally it was Look at this really compelling deal we're offering, ending the pandemic for you, all the mitigation measures, mask wearing, all that goes away. You just have to get the shot, right? Just get the shot and it's done for you. You're protected and you don't have to worry about any of the bull crap, mitigation, Fauci madness, right? Oh no, but now they changed their minds because as I said, the vaccines fade and it turns out they were wrong, but they don't care that they were wrong. You're not supposed to notice that they were wrong. In fact, now they're doing everything they can to mandate this at the federal level for federal government employees, for the military. And oh, that's right, for the rest of you, if you live in a red state, if you don't have Democrats calling the shots in City Hall or in the State House, they're still going to push private companies to enforce mandates against you. Here's Biden on that issue. Today I'm calling on more country, more companies, I should say, in the private sector to step up with vaccine requirements that will reach millions more people. If you're a business leader, a nonprofit leader, a state or local leader who has been waiting for full FDA approval to require vaccinations, I call on you now to do that. Require it. Do what I did last month. Require your employees to get vaccinated or face strict requirements. Mandates from private employers all across the country. Now, keep in mind that this is more than just the federal government asking nicely. The federal government, when it comes to, say, the hospital system, has a tremendous amount of influence because of the scope and scale of Medicare and Medicaid payments and all the different federal funding that goes into health care across the country. So are hospitals going to require this? Probably. A lot of them already have. Who else? Uber still makes you wear a mask like an idiot in the back seat. I mean, there are big companies that across the country, no matter what the state laws are, no matter what the health authorities in that state have decided, They still want masks for everybody, even though masks don't work. But conversation will continue to have here on the show. Do they care that they've been wrong? Do they care that the advice, or I'm sorry, not advice, the demands that they've made at different stages of this pandemic have proven to be overreach without scientific basis? No, in fact, they are emboldened. Tyrants never feel like they have to learn a lesson from their overreach. In fact, the only lesson is usually how much more can they overreach the next time? I give you the mayor of New York City, the moron in chief, if you will, Bill de Blasio. Here he is. And what a perfect moment for this, given the big news today. And we're so thrilled. The FDA has announced today the full approval of the Pfizer vaccine. This is a game changing moment. We've been waiting for this for a long time to have the full approval of vaccine. We now have it. This helps us move forward and we're moving forward with our schools with this new vaccine mandate. Yeah. Bill de Blasio saying that uh, we've got to move forward with more mandates, more mandates. Oh, but just remember this, the mandate's already in effect in New York City public, or will be in effect, I should say, they've already decided on it. If you're going to be a public school employee in New York, you must be vaccinated, at least one dose. By the way, they're going to make you get the second dose by September We want our schools to be extraordinarily safe all year long. So today, a major announcement to ensure the safety of our schools, of our kids, of all the adults in our schools as well. Today, the New York City Department of Health will be issuing an order 
requiring all staff in the New York City public schools to be vaccinated. This will require that all staff of every kind, principals, teachers, custodians, uh, food service, you name it, needs to have at least one dose by September 27th. The entire staff by September 27th, at least one dose. Mandates for COVID vaccines. They said they wouldn't do this, and now they're straight up doing it all over the place. Everywhere where they think they can get away with it, where they have the power to do it, they are doing it. We have to all wonder, what does this lead to? Where does this go? I mean, what, what comes next? Well, if you look, for example, at uh, Australia, just to give you a sense of what can happen here, the Australians, generally a country that you'd think of as having very nice, friendly uh, people, English-speaking nation, very close to America in many ways, Australia's completely lost its mind over COVID. I mean, the Australian government has turned into some dystopian novel version of the land down under. It's terrifying to see what they're doing there. These public health bureaucrats and politicians are utter morons, and what they're doing is completely insane. Here's an Australian television report about how they're arresting people for violating. I mean, they'll actually arrest you for violating mitigation measures. It's those doing the wrong thing driving our record case numbers. Among the most concerning cases, a COVID patient who's tonight on the run from a hotspot. Police and health authorities have issued an urgent appeal. Anthony Caram knows he is COVID positive when he steps into this public lift. Already breaking so many rules, he doesn't bother to cover his mouth as he sneezes and splutters. The 27-year-old is still infectious, but has gone missing from his Wentworth Point apartment. A warrant now issued for his arrest. This 27-year-old chap who apparently has expressed the view that he doesn't care less whether he spreads the virus, is one example of the worst of the worst. They're shaming people now on Australian national news for not covering their mouth when they cough while they have COVID. I had to throw that in there too, as if it's not enough that they're putting this guy on TV because he left his apartment, which they say you're not allowed to do. How different really is Australia from Communist Party-controlled China, where they were welding people into their homes, apparently. Like, you were not allowed to leave until the government came in and opened the door that they had welded shut for you again. I mean, how, how different is it, really? You just you have to wonder, what is wrong with these lunatics? Well, the truth is that they are emotionally broken and they're in love with the power they have as a result of all of this. So they either want to be controlled or they want to control others. Freedom doesn't enter into the conversation. Terrifying what's happening, not just in Australia, but here at home in America, too. Whereas Democrats would have once pointed to Australia and said, oh, come on, we're not going to do that. Now you can see there are a lot of lockdowners and Fauciites who say, yeah, you know, Australia's really got it right. Their priorities, they've got those straight. All right, we got more on the COVID-19 mandates with Danielle D'Souza Gill when we come back. But right now, I want to let you know about my friends at My Digital Money. The crypto market's very hot right now. It seems like everyone wants to get in on the action, but it's not that easy to get started. That's why Colin Plume, the CEO of Noble Gold, decided to create My Digital Money. It's an easy-to-use, self-trading crypto IRA platform with concierge-level customer service. It's one of the few U.S.-based cryptocurrency companies that will answer your phone call and help you get started. And because your comfort and security is their absolute top priority, they offer an unparalleled military-grade security for your coins, trigger orders to help you secure opportunities for gains or limit losses without having to watch your account 24-7, a play money account so you can test the market without risking your money. And with the recent pullback of most of the major cryptocurrencies, this might be the best time to get into this exciting technology-based investment. When it comes to your money, you deserve a team of dedicated professionals that have your back, speak to you honestly, and treat you like a human, not a number. Check them out at MyDigitalMoney.com. That's MyDigitalMoney.com. Danielle D'Souza Gill is going to stop by when we come back. With a Pfizer vaccine now fully approved by the FDA, vaccine mandates are likely to expand around the country. Today, the Pentagon announced that officials are preparing to issue guidance requiring vaccinations for all military personnel. Now that the Pfizer vaccine has been approved, the department is prepared to issue updated guidance requiring all service members to be vaccinated. A timeline for vaccination completion will be provided in the coming days. 
Uh, the health of the force uh, is, as always, uh, our military and our civilian employees, families and communities is a top priority. Uh, so it's important to remind everyone that these efforts ensure the safety of our service members and promote the readiness of our force, not to mention uh, the health and safety of the communities around the country in which we live. Vaccine mandates are also being rolled out in hundreds of colleges and universities around the country. The University of Virginia recently announced that they were disenrolling 238 for failing to comply with the school's vaccine requirements. So what can Americans expect in the coming weeks as more and more institutions implement and expand mandates? Join me now to give her perspective is the host of the Epic Times Counterculture podcast, Danielle D'Souza Gill. Danielle, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me, Buck. So let's just, let's work through this, right? First off, federal government, notably the military, vaccine mandates going into effect, the FDA full authorization is just adding more momentum behind these demands. What's going on at the federal level? I think this really shows the fact that, you know, they were pushing the vaccine long before now. They were pushing it so much. And so the fact that now they're saying, oh, wow, only now do we have the full FDA approval. Well, that's disturbing. Why were you pushing it so much even before this? So I think this now is just going to lead to even more mandates for the vaccine. And um, many in our military probably don't all want to get the vaccine. And I think that this is all going to backfire on the left because the more they try to force people to get it, the more skeptical people are going to be of the vaccine because they know how much the left is pushing it on them. Do we have any sense as to whether there are going to be people who decide to mass non-comply? Essentially, are there, are there any efforts to organize in the federal government or in any of the federal agencies out there against this kind of thing? Because it seems, Danielle, like the way this is being set up is you're in the military, for example, or let's say you're, you work for any number of different federal uh, government organizations, you either get the shot or you lose your job. So if that stands, a lot, either a lot of people are going to be out of a job or they're going to be getting the jab. Absolutely. And I think the other thing, too, is if you're forced to get the vaccine, let's say your company forces you to get it, and then you have a side effect or you have something wrong that happens to you because of that, you should absolutely sue them because they forced you to do that. So I think that this is all really going to backfire on them. And where are we with school mandates? I, I heard a whole host of different things from people who are in, at the grad school level about just insane COVID policies. Can you give us an update on where those kind of vaccine mandates stand? Yeah, they're really based on the school and we've seen that it's varied. Some people say that, you know, you have to get the vaccine in order to return to on-campus learning. Some say that, you know, if you don't, even for let's say primary education, you have to get your parent to sign something. So it really varies and both sides are furious because many on the left think, oh, that's not enough. Even if we force you, let's say, to wear a mask, that's not enough. So nothing really is ever enough for the left. Even if they force you to comply by their rules, that's never gonna be enough because the next thing we know, it's the next booster, the next booster, the next thing. Yeah, is there any reason to believe that the mandates that are going into effect here aren't going to be essentially permanent mandates? We, we know from the most recent data, just the fact that they're calling for boosters proves that these are not lifetime vaccines. We already know that, and they didn't even last a year before, really it was about six months for most people before we're being told that you have to get another shot. So these vaccine mandates are really going to it's almost like we're heading into it feels like Danielle, the flu shot forever, except it's the covid shot forever. The COVID shot forever. And who knows when we're going to be able to travel without a mask? I mean, masks on planes, it seems like now that's just what they would call the new normal. And I think it's it's another level to really constantly be forcing people to be injected with something that literally only now has gotten the full FDA approval. And I think if the left was focused on what they call the science, they would have until now maybe been a little bit more skeptical of the vaccine and only now started to push the vaccine. But the fact that they've been pushing it so much up until now I think shows that that is really not their goal. Do you think that they even want to go back? I mean, the, the apparatus of the Democrat left in this country, I'm just wondering what, what your take is on whether they even want to go back to normal ever, or are a lot of the people in charge? Because it doesn't really affect them, right? They don't, okay, they'll get the shot, and maybe they'll even find a workaround for themselves for the shot in the future, but they can work remote, they can have the parties they want, they can gather in Martha's Vineyard, they can fly private, they can do all these different things. 
And yet this gives them a lot of ability to influence and dictate to all the rest of us. So do they want to go back to normal? What do they want? I think they absolutely don't want to go back to normal because all of this is what allowed them to start this mail-in ballot situation from the beginning. So this really only helps them not only with elections, but also with you know their own um, businesses, for example. All the big businesses, they all support the left. All these CEOs, they all donate money to the Democrats. Meanwhile, small businesses are oftentimes conservative. And so this whole thing has really led to big businesses exploding, Amazon exploding, and small businesses closing because of these lockdowns instituted by Democrats. Democrats. So it's really like an I scratch your back, you scratch my back kind of thing with corporations because they're helping the corporations and then donating to Democrats. So I think in almost every situation, it helps the Democrats and not to mention, like you said, Obama's having his birthday party in Martha's Vineyard. They don't actually follow these things. If we see pictures of Biden, they're not always wearing masks anyways, meanwhile, forcing us to. And if we don't, basically losing our jobs and our careers. You think we're at the point where we're going to start to see people realize the Biden administration's handling of COVID isn't what was promised. Remember he said he would shut down the virus, not the economy. Well, the economy's kind of, you know, meh at best right now and inflation's high. And there are plenty of, you won't call, we wouldn't call them shut, shutdowns, but mitigation harassment for COVID is very strong these days. Right. And I mean, he's doing so well on so many fronts. Gas prices are up. I mean, Afghanistan is a huge mess. So I'm not exactly sure what it is would be his selling point for a reelection or even for Kamala Harris, who has pretty low polling. But I think that the Democrats are really trying to take full advantage of COVID, even though now people are so sick of all of this and they're tired of being forced to do things by the Democrats when they really just want to go back to their normal lives, reemerge from their homes and not be forced to uh, follow these mandates. Danielle, thanks for being with us. Good to talk to you. Thank you. The disaster in Kabul continues to unfold as thousands of Americans and Afghan nationals scramble to flee Afghanistan. Jake Beckett is an Army veteran and is running for U.S. Senate for Arkansas. He'll give us his perspective when we come back. But first, let's talk about the most valuable asset you own, your home. How much equity do you have in your home? 50,000, 100,000, more? Cybercrime experts are alerting homeowners that the more equity you have, the greater the chance foreign and domestic criminals will come after you. Home title theft is one of the fastest growing crimes out there. In fact, Home Title Lock, America's leader in home title protection, is alerting homeowners they could already be a victim and not know it. Here's how it goes down. First, cyber thieves search hundreds of public databases for high equity homes. Next, they pull your home's online title, forge your signature, stating you sold your home and take out loans using your equity. You're not covered by insurance, your bank, or common identity theft programs. Protect your most valuable asset. Register your address now to see if you're already a victim and receive a complete title history of your home, a $100 value, free. Go to HomeTitleLock.com. That's HomeTitleLock.com. We'll be right back with more Hold the Line. Chaos continues in Afghanistan as thousands rush to Kabul International Airport in an attempt to flee the Taliban-controlled country. The videos are difficult to watch, not only for the average American, but for those military veterans who served our country in that country. Jake Beckett, who played four years in the NFL as a former first lieutenant who served in the Army's 101st Airborne Division, is now a candidate for the U.S. Senate in the great state of Arkansas, and he's with us to discuss all of this. Jake, great to have you back. Hey, it's great to be on with you. Thanks for having me. So first, what do you feel uh, is the, the over, overarching uh, assessment you'd give of where we are right now for the Biden administration's withdrawal plan? I mean, how do you see this going? Well, it's obviously been a catastrophe for the country, and it is 100% on the Biden administration and his pathetic lack of leadership. Look, this, this withdrawal uh, was proceeding in an orderly manner as laid out by President Trump, uh, as laid out by the previous administration, uh, and, and Joe Biden has utterly botched it to the detriment of not only Afghanistan, the American military, but to our overall prestige and, and power projection worldwide. I think this has far-reaching ramifications uh, beyond just one failed Middle Eastern state. I think the Chinese are watching uh, as they cast their eyes, their, their gaze towards Taiwan. I think the Iranians and North Koreans are watching this as they uh, look to accelerate their nuclear weapons programs. And I think the Russians are, are eyeing this 
as they look towards uh, more advances in Eastern Europe. It's an absolute disgrace. And, and Joe Biden, look, if, if he can't get it figured out, if he can't make adjustments to hit him in his administration, he should step aside for the sake of the American people. Here is a uh, ambassador from the uh, Obama administration era who had some words about Joe Biden's handling of the situation so, uh, so far. Here's what he says. It has created a global crisis, quite frankly. Uh, uh, it has emboldened uh, violent uh, Islamic radicals. Uh, and I think we're all going to see the fallout of that, certainly in Pakistan. They championed the Taliban because they felt they had no choice. Well, the Taliban victory, the narrative of defeating the, the, great, uh, the great infidel empowers radicals in Pakistan. What do you think about the threat of Afghanistan becoming a major platform for terrorism now, not just because of the Taliban's control, but also the entire world is watching this unfold? This will, it already is appearing in jihadist propaganda as a massive victory for Khorasan against the infidels. Absolutely. I think that assessment is generally correct. Uh, I think this will embolden terrorists globally and it will harm the prestige of this country. And I've always said that, look, world, world peace, the security in this world rests solely on American strength, the Pax Americana, which has lasted since World War II, which has survived through the Cold War, through Desert Storm, and through the last 20 years of the Middle Eastern conflicts, has solely rested on American power and prestige. We're seeing it crumble before our eyes due to the Biden administration, due to his pathetic lack of leadership. And look, I think the, the connection to Pakistan uh, is a very important one. They are a nuclear power. Uh, I think they are far more radical than they are uh, generally considered by the mainstream media uh, and organizations like the UN. I, I think they've enabled the Taliban and al-Qaeda over the last 20 years. And, and look, they were, they were the prime reason why our original victories in late 2001, early 2002, through Special Operations Forces and the Northern Alliance, uh, really did not have any achievable goals beyond that point due to Pakistan. Meanwhile, the White House with Jen Psaki as press secretary is telling people that it is irresponsible to claim Americans are stuck. Here's what she said. Most of the criticism is not of leaving Afghanistan. It's the way that he has ordered it to happen by pulling the troops before getting these Americans who are now stranded. Does he have a sense of that? First of all, I think it's irresponsible to say Americans are stranded. They are not. We are committed to bringing Americans who want to come home home. We are in touch with them via phone, via text, via email, via any way that we can possibly reach Americans to get them home if they want to return home. There are no Americans stranded is the White House's official position on what's happening in Afghanistan. Right I'm now. just calling you out for saying that we are stranding Americans in Afghanistan. Um, Jake, they're stranded. What the heck is she talking about? Well, this is gaslighting of the highest order, and it's infuriating because Look, other countries like the British, through their SAS, the French Special Forces, they've been rescuing their citizens, British and French citizens. Other countries are executing hostage rescue programs as we speak. Meanwhile, the American military has done nothing. We're making excuses. Look, sending a text message to an American citizen who is trapped behind Taliban enemy lines is an absolute pathetic excuse. Look, Jin Saki should be ashamed of herself, this entire administration. Is, is just pitiful. I don't have any other words to say it. As a recently uh, separated Army veteran, it, it's an absolute disgrace and it's infuriating. Any doubt on your mind that, I mean, you, you were 101st Airborne, I know, uh, Jake. If, if the White House gave the order for, whether it's Marines, part of a Marine Expeditionary Force, or a unit like the one you served in, to just go out and pick up Americans, why, why can't we do that if other countries, other NATO allies are doing that. That, that seems to be a, a question that we can't get good answers to. Well, it has not traditionally been in the character of American military leadership to make excuses. And unfortunately, that's all we've seen. Lloyd Austin said just last week that we don't have the capability to go rescue American citizens. That is not only untrue, that is just a, a pathetic excuse. Look, if Winston Churchill in 1940 can launch civilian fishing boats to go rescue the British Army at Dunkirk, then we can, we can certainly go retake Bagram Airfield if, if that's what's necessary to extricate these stranded Americans. Look, we have thousands, if not tens of thousands of American citizens who are trapped behind enemy lines and the Biden administration's 
uh, that their company line right now is we are sending them text messages. That is pathetic and it's not enough. Even though the Biden administration is doing uh, everything it can to get Americans out of that country first and foremost, is there anything they should be doing that they are not doing? Well, I'd like to highlight, and I'm very concerned about, I've seen some of these uh, images and videos. Look, everyone, it's, it's hard to watch the images and videos of Afghans clinging to American cargo planes as they take off. And I'm also very disturbed at looking at the interior of some of these cargo planes. The, the administration is saying that we're uh, evacuating tens of thousands of people. Look, where are all the American citizens? Look, it, 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 as the United States should be doing, we should be prioritizing American citizens first. That is our first duty, is loyalty to the United States of America and her citizens. Look, we should prioritize getting at American citizens first, securing American citizens, getting them back home safely, then worrying about anyone else out of Afghanistan. Jake, thanks for your service, first and foremost, and thank you for your perspective on all this. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Buck. Governor Cuomo's final day in office. Woohoo! That also means I officially owe New York City Councilman Joe Borelli a fancy dinner, and we've already been in discussions about it, just so you know, it's going to happen. He's going to join us next to talk about this final chapter in the Cuomo saga. But right now, I want to tell you about my digital money. The crypto market's hot right now. It seems like everybody wants to get in on the action, whether it's buying Bitcoin, Ethereum, or any of the dozens of tokens out there. But it's not that easy to get started. That's why Colin Plume, the CEO of Noble Gold, decided to create my digital money. It's an easy-to-use, self-trading crypto IRA platform with concierge-level customer service. It's one of the few U.S.-based cryptocurrency companies that will answer your phone call and help you get started. Because your comfort and security is their absolute top priority, they offer an unparalleled military-grade security for your coins, trigger orders to help you secure opportunities for gains or limit losses, without having to watch your account 24-7, a play money account so you can test the market without risking your money, and with the recent pullback of most of the major cryptocurrencies, this might be the best time to get into this exciting technology-based investment. When it comes to your money, you deserve a team of dedicated professionals who have your back, speak to you honestly, and treat you like a human, not a number. Check them out at MyDigitalMoney.com. That's MyDigitalMoney.com. New York City Councilman Joe Borelli joins us when we come back. Of course, everyone has a right to come forward, and we applaud their bravery and courage in doing so. But allegations must still be scrutinized and verified. I understand that there are moments of intense political pressure and media frenzy that cause a rush to judgment, but that is not right. It's not fair or sustainable. The Attorney General's report was designed to be a political firecracker on an explosive topic, and it worked there was a political and media stampede. But the truth will out in time. On his last day in office, disgraced New York Governor Andrew Cuomo did a final pushback against the state attorney general's sexual harassment investigation that led to his resignation while taking a few shots at the far left and a victory lap for his successes. I mean, this is classic Cuomo. Here to react to it all, New York City Council member Joe Borelli. First of all, sir, little golf clap. You called it. You nailed it. I don't even know how far back now. Maybe uh, about a year or so. I think you told us at least maybe it was the last fall when the nursing home thing came out and then the sexual harassment scandal got up and running. You said he wasn't going to last. You were correct. And you're a man who's going to be collecting a uh, expensive fancy dinner here in New York, courtesy of yours truly. But tell me this. I mean, any surprises from Cuomo in his last day? That speech was absurd. I mean, the fact that he's trying to say the attorney general's report was a political firecracker when it was he who actually demanded the investigation because of not one, but eventually 11 now in, in the AG's report, right? I mean, there wasn't even 11 people to begin with. The, the attorney general's investigation actually uncovered more women uh, that we didn't even know about. And they uncovered women and did a 168-page report. They interviewed 100 hours of witnesses. Witnesses. They took into account Andrew Cuomo's own defense uh, and his own statements and his own uh, accounts of his actions, and they determined 
that he was in fact guilty of committing sexual harassment that violated the, the city, state, and federal criminal statutes. I mean, yes, it's not a grand jury, it's not a jury of his peers or anything like that, but this to say this was some uh, far-flung investigation that had no merit is just absurd. We're not talking about one woman who might have mistaken uh, a glance or a look or a comment. These are accusations that were substantiated, 11 women who in some cases were actually groped. You know, uh, good luck to Governor Hochul and really genuinely good riddance to Andrew Cuomo. Here he is, the former, I guess we could say former now, governor of New York State, praising his handling of COVID, Joe, which, I mean, the, the goal for this one, I thought, was pretty amazing, even for him. Please don't forget what we learned together last year. And don't forget what we accomplished. We went from the highest infection rate in the nation to the lowest. We did what no one thought could be done. Why? Because when the rest of the nation put their head in the sand and denied science and played politics, we faced up to the facts and we made the tough but necessary decisions. Really? I mean, sending people's uh, grandparents back into nursing homes when they had COVID to in fact, other people's grandparents and have the highest death rate per capita, New York and New Jersey, this area, any place in the whole country. Those were the tough calls. I mean, I feel like tough doesn't mean what he thinks it means. It, there is no handicapping of the performance of uh, America's elected leaders that puts Governor Cuomo anywhere near the top uh, of the COVID response department. And, and I'll be objective. There are some Democrats, I think, who did a good job. There are some Republicans, I think, who did a good job. Um, but to say that this person who has uh, objectively the worst record on COVID and has uh, statistics that are directly attributable to his nurse, nursing home scandal just really, really makes the gall uh, that much more nauseous. You know, and a, a lot of it, to some degree, could be forgiven if it wasn't for his own self-aggrandizement. Obviously, we have the book deal. But even before the corrupt book deal, you have to remember, this is a guy who basically had state artists like do this giant poster commemorating his success. I mean, this is what a sick person does. A sick person or, or maybe Mao Zedong or, or Pol Pot, those are people who, who commission government artists to write celebratory posters of themselves and have them hung up around the state. I mean, it's just insane. This is a guy who really knows no bounds. Uh, he, he has no concept of his own standing with his own constituents. He has no concept of his own culpability of his actions. And, you know, he's someone who thought the rules didn't apply to him. Remember, if you were his friend or family, you got that necessary COVID test. If you were one of the, the, the people in nursing homes, there wasn't enough of you. It's just sick buck. And like I said, I wish Kathy Hochul all the luck in the world. A year from now, we'll be talking politics about the governor's race, and I'll be against her. I'm, I'm with Lee Zeldin, and he's a great choice. But just thankfully for the people of this state, uh, it's a new day, and, and good luck to the new governor. Any chance in your mind that Governor Cuomo tries to come back and become the governor again? He, he said no. He said he has no interest. Uh, and I think that's more the result of the public really rejecting him. And I think it's more the result of the assembly uh, still on the verge of releasing their report, which goes into uh, uh, the, the nursing home uh, stats and the corrupt book deal. And a friend of mine, Assemblyman Mike Montesano, who's the, the ranking member on the Judiciary Committee, he's already said publicly that this assembly report is going to have violations of New York State's public officer law. He should be punished just like any member of the state legislature would if they violated that same code. Here is uh, Governor Cuomo. I just want to get your take on this. Consider you are now the oracle of Staten Island and, you know, can, can see the future, the sage of Staten Island. Uh, we have a big uh, election coming up here in New York City for the mayor's office. Here's what Governor Cuomo says about how he thinks that's going to shake out. Eric Adams will be the next mayor of New York City. I think he'll bring a new philosophy and competence to the position, which can give New York City residents hope for the future. You think he is? Is he right about that one? Or is there a real chance we might get still a pretty close one with uh, our mutual friend on the Republican side of the ticket? Hey, hey, I hope so. And I'm supporting Curtis and I'm voting for Curtis. It is an uphill battle, though. 
Um, you know, it's just so amazing that that even on his way out, as he's literally resigning in shame uh, and on the verge of maybe a criminal prosecution, that he still has time to take one more swipe at Bill de Blasio. Uh, you know, I, I, I feel like in 20 years, 30 years, uh, as long as he lives, he's still going to be that old, grumpy, uh, long, drawn out man who's shouting at the clouds about Bill de Blasio. Um, it, it's just it's it just uncanny Cuomo for that to have happened in his final speech. I gotta say, I, anytime somebody is trashing Bill de Blasio for a second, I, all I care about is that Bill de Blasio is being trashed because he certainly deserves it. But hey, man, great to have you as always. And uh, we got dinner on the books. See you there. Sounds good. Coming up, former CIA and NSA Director General Michael Hayden endorsed the idea the MAGA wearing unvac should be deported to Afghanistan. Yeah, you heard that right. We'll get into that after the break. But first, if you're anything like me, you have to start your day with a healthy dose of caffeine. And that means kicking off my morning with Black Rifle Coffee. Not only is this some of the best coffee I've ever tasted, it's a veteran-owned company that serves premium coffee to people who love America. Black Rifle Coffee is continually committed to supporting veteran law enforcement and first responder causes. This summer, Black Rifle invites you to enjoy your coffee, not just the great taste, but also the places you drink it, the passion and adventure it fuels and inspires, and the entertainment Black Rifle serves along the way. Whether you're brewing the perfect cup of pour over or cracking a can of 300, Black Rifle is here to fuel your way wherever the summer takes you. Black Rifle Coffee imports its high quality beans from all over the world, and the team at Black Rifle is always researching and experimenting with new roasting methods. Purchase some today. Get it for yourself. Try it. It's what I drink every morning. Go to blackriflecoffee.com slash buck and use code buck at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. That's blackriflecoffee.com slash buck and use code buck at checkout for 20% off. Quick hits coming up next. Stay with us. Pelosi breaks her own COVID rules in Napa because... She can. She's Queen Nancy, right? And Australia takes heartbreaking measures, shocking stuff to keep its citizens indoors. Let's get into all this in quick hits. And uh, first off, here is Nancy Pelosi at a DCC, DCCC. It's always tough to get that right. Fundraiser. A lot of maskless people, though. What's going on with that? We had in store for later, but for now. Question was asked this morning by Ambassador Solomon about young people and how we're reaching out to young people in the Olympics. Well, young people, we always ask them, how do you want to be reached out to? And one of the main responses... Gosh, a lot of people in close quarters. Now, they are outside, but is that acceptable for everybody else to do or only for fancy people at a DCCC triple C event, yeah? Interesting. Remember, the people that are telling you all the time that you need to be constantly terrified of COVID, they themselves don't seem particularly terrified, do they? They like to break those rules. They seem to get some kind of joy out of making sure that you have to or are supposed to obey at all times, but they obey when they feel like it. And when they don't, well, of course, they're important, they're powerful. You could say they're sophisticated and therefore don't have to worry about spreading the virus that has ripped through the country so much. This one, I got to say, this really uh, bothered me at a deep level. I'm sure it will a lot of you too. In Australia, there were rescue dogs who were shot, shot dead uh, because of COVID-19 restrictions. Here's what the, the story, this was in a rural part of Australia. Some impounded dogs due to be rescued by a shelter have instead been shot dead by a rural council in uh, New South Wales, I guess it is, under its interpretation of covid 19 restrictions, alarming animal activists, and prompting a government probe. Berkshire Council in the state's northwest killed the dogs to prevent volunteers at the shelter from traveling to pick up the animals. So instead of allowing animals to be uh, saved uh, from being impounded, saved and brought to a shelter where they would have been fine, uh, this city council in Australia, because they're so terrified of COVID, you see, uh, they, they just had these dogs shot. They killed them. People are executing on orders like savages because they're so scared of COVID. And really what we should realize is we should be scared of the people that are willing to do this stuff. The people that will lock you up in your home, the people that will tell you that your child must be masked up for years, years on end. They're never going to stop with this. These people are lunatic. There's something wrong with them. 
but that's where we are. That's the, that's the reality, unfortunately, of the situation in which we find ourselves globally. The over-anxious, uh, media brainwashed, lockdown libs are, are still calling the shots. We have not yet had the backlash we need, the just go Fauci yourself across the board. And that's where we all need to be. You're gonna go Fauci yourself. Uh, I actually worked for this guy at the CIA and I didn't talk politics with him, so I didn't know that he was a loon at the time, but he's clearly a loon. He's the NS, former NSA and CIA director and a four-star general in the Air Force before that. Ex-NSA director Michael Hayden had, uh, has endorsed deporting the MAGA-wearing unvaxxed to Afghanistan. Somebody tweeted out, can we send the MAGA-wearing unvaxxed to Afghanistan? You know you sending that plane back empty. And Hayden responded, good idea. Now, I understand... I like jokes too. I like people that will occasionally make a joke, and even if it can be a little bit inappropriate, a little bit of a problem, I get it. Uh, this is not, he actually feels this way. I don't think this is, first of all, it's not funny. It's not clever. And second of all, this guy despises Trump voters. And he was the director of the NSA, then the CIA, which these organizations, look, I used to work at the CIA. It's becoming embarrassing, honestly. I mean, what, what, what this has done. This is not something that you want to throw to the top of your resume. Oh my gosh, I was in the CIA. What? What? It's crazy. Um, oh, by the way, he also retweeted out, their Taliban, our Taliban, um, as in our people that drive around with American flags and pickup trucks are somehow equivalent to a bunch of barbarians who will murder and mutilate people who do not believe in their austere interpretation of the Quran. That seems to be uh, quite... Quite a nasty thing to believe if you're a senior government official, as Mike Hayden was, certainly for a long time, and constantly appears on CNN and other places to give his analysis on things. He is the absolute worst in so many ways, but not alone in his awfulness. A lot of people at the top ranks of the intelligence community have shown us that they are, in fact, part of the deep state, and they are absolutely terrible, terrible human beings who despise you and me. I assume if you watch the show, you probably agree with me, right? You found this love America, and live in the real world, unlike all these people that watch CNN and MSNBC. So uh, Mike Hayden thinks that you and I are a clear and present danger to national security and all the rest of it. And then there's this. Larry Elder is a good man. He's a friend, known Larry for, for quite some time. He's a good, good guy in the conservative media, was a radio host, columnist. And he is doing pretty well in his quest to become the next governor of California, assuming, well, we'll have to see what happens, of course, with Gavin Newsom's recall. But Larry Elder is running, folks. And he, uh, he was the topic of a column here, an LA Times column. Larry Elder is the black face of white supremacy. Stunning, isn't it, that uh, there is this kind of out in the open racism the left can engage in, but because they're leftists, they can get away with it. Something we should change, friends. We should hold them accountable. That's it for tonight's Hold the Line, the No Spin News with Bill O'Reilly's up next. Shields high.